And I come back to that, you know, with what, what's contentious with what I've said, an ancestral way of eating, fresh local seasonal whole food based on your culture and environment, avoiding added sugar and processed food. That empowers the individual, disempowers the corporates, it decentralises buying power, it puts it back to the local farmer, the local community. Welcome to the Recovery and Transformation Podcast, the show that links personal health with societal well-being. I'm your host, Samir Dosani. I'm an activist, a PhD student, and a health coach based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. This show explores the root causes of disease and talks about how people are recovering and transforming every day. Hi, and welcome to another episode. My guest today is Dr. Gary Fetke. Dr. Fetke is a medical doctor in Australia who's been practicing for more than 40 years. A few years ago, Gary was facing a lawsuit for recommending that his diabetic patients not be given so much sugar. That led him down the rabbit hole of low carb and ancestrally appropriate diets, but it also led him and his wife Belinda to research into the origins of the food guidelines, first in the US and then in Australia and now around the world. If you've heard Dr. Fetke before, I'd still ask that you pay attention to this interview because we cover ground that may be new for a lot of people, particularly the the question of how these guidelines and ways of eating are getting exported to developing countries around the world and why obesity rates in places like the Pacific Island countries are among the highest in the world. If you like this conversation, please do make sure to leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening. With that, please enjoy my discussion with Dr. Gary Fetke. Dr. Gary Fetke, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to meet you. So I wonder if you could tell us, so how long have you been sort of a practicing medical doctor in, in Tasmania exclusively or around Australia? What's, tell us about um, your career. Around Australia, um, 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 40 years. i have got to think carefully about that, but I've been practicing for a long time. Um, quite proudly, I was the youngest in my medical year and I was the youngest person to um, finish their surgical fellowship. Um, so I had that at the age of 29. Most people get it in their 30s. Um, and um, I was very fortunate that uh, I married my childhood sweetheart and, and we're still together uh, right now. Three children, um, two grandchildren. And I, I, I mentioned all that because that's, you know, if you have a solid family base, it allows you to feel confident about doing the right thing. And so I've been a surgeon uh, in northern Tasmania for uh, over well, <clears throat> um, 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 30 odd years. And as an orthopedic surgeon, we come across more and more lifestyle related conditions, whether or not it's osteoarthritis, or it's wear and tear, but or obesity related problems. But specifically in my practice, a lot of diabetic complications. <clears throat> and my public hospital appointment involved taking on most of the patients which a lot of people didn't want to do so particularly those with diabetic foot ulcers those with infected joint replacements and those if, someone, if someone came in with a wrong. if someone came in with a foot ulcer you were you were chopping toes off that kind of stuff is that what you were doing well ultimately they'd find themselves to my clinic we'd try and save the foot save you know do all the local treatments but where that was an uncommon thing 30 years ago 20 years ago even 15 years ago it just became a, a weekly barrage and the work that i've actually did in the developing world particularly in the south pacific again the same scenario this tsunami of diabetes related complications which is a no-win situation in the majority of cases and you end up starting with trimming off you know cleaning an ulcer then taking a toe off and then a bit more another second toe and a third toe and then a bit of the forefoot and then right through to below knee amputations and as time went on, I recognised that you know that surgery is just band-aiding the problem when the primary problem is poor metabolic health. And the primary problem behind that, particularly with diabetes, is diet. And that diet is when it's too high in sugar and carbohydrates. And effectively, in my practice, when patients would come to me, I'd say, drop your sugar, stop your carbohydrate intake, get your diabetes under control and eat some protein. And I would actually prescribe on the medical chart in host patients in hospital for them to have two eggs and a piece of cheese. 
And literally, with an avoidance of carbohydrate and a small amount of protein, we're able to start turning around foot ulceration. Not cure, but certainly start turning around that, that primary problem that they've come to attend with. <clears throat> so in the process of all that, I started working through this biochemistry and the whole concept. And I still hold Belinda and my daughter responsible because we're in um, uh, Los Angeles in a layover. And um, they said, oh, you've got to get on social media and start talking about sugar. Anyway, so I signed up on Facebook. We launched a website. <clears throat> Within 24 hours, I was targeted by someone who was working with Coca-Cola. Um, the food industry don't like my message because it's different. I'm not a celebrity chef. I'm not in the media. You have an orthopedic surgeon who's sick and tired of chopping limbs off who's saying actually sugar, carbohydrates, ultra-processed food are to blame. And so I became a target. I'm, I'm a little curious, for, why, why you, man? I mean, like, no offense, but um, Tasmania is hardly, you know, the, the center yeah, of the Absolutely. Yeah. We're, you know, we're a tiny little island state off the bottom end of Australia. And that was the, the crazy thing. But social media being a powerful tool, my voice was reaching well and truly beyond the, the local community. And as I reached out and started understanding this and that whole con that whole low carbohydrate community, low carb, healthy fat. Now you know some kind of regards you know ketogenic diets. I became part of that, and because of that, um, my message was getting you know along a lot further. Like my Twitter feed now, you know, has two million hits a, a month on it. So it, it's a significant in the game of preventative health. And as I say, I, you know, it, it, I've got nothing to gain from it. And that message of a surgeon speaking out was gaining more traction and some more notoriety. Yes. And then in 2014, I think it's 2014, um, I was, you know, <clears throat> I was reported to the medical board for the first of three occasions, each time by dietitians for giving dietary advice that was outside of my scope of practice. And all I was saying to my patients, stop eating sugar and carbs and get control of your diabetes. When we've tracked all that back and we've gotten hold of the internal memorandums and minutes of meetings of the cereal industry here in Australia, literally I became there with the minutes of the meetings were saying cereal sales is down in Australia and New Zealand because of the concepts of low carb and paleo and these seven people are to be targeted and i was the only australian doctor on that list so part of me goes crikey that's you know we're up against the billion dollar boys here and the other part of me is quite proud about the fact that you know there's a, there's a saying i presume you know it's worldwide but it's it you know we belinda and i are just a couple of mosquitoes in a room you know we're not much at all but it's very hard to go to sleep with mosquitoes buzzing around so that's what I, I think all of us speaking up, we might think we're small fry, but if we actually keep buzzing away and keep the same message going that people can return their health by incremental changes, particularly in their diet and getting away from the ultra processed foods. And that means decentralizing away from buying powers. It means taking away money from the processed food industry. And when you do that, particularly in diabetes, you actually take that away from the pharmaceutical industry. You actually de-prescribe, you come off medications, you get better control, you're not part of the ongoing sickness industry. It's, it's empowering for the individual and it's disempowering for the corporates. I mean, it's certainly been empowering for me as, as a health coach, not even a doctor, to help people, you know, be able to... I had one client who's been on insulin for, for 20 years plus, and uh, first time in his life he's, he can remember, you know, waking up without pain not going to the bathroom, you know, six, seven times a night and so on. And and this is when we're told that diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. It only gets worse. It never gets better. So, um, you know, certainly thanks for the role that you played in this bigger debate, because I don't think there would be um, thousands of people like like me out there and, and millions of patients seeing benefit if it weren't for some of the early adopters uh, like yourself who were really spreading I think, this message. You know, I'm not alone in this situation of being targeted. <clears throat> um, people have been targeted for 100 years over trying to raise this, um, you know, 
in recent times, it's been you know myself here, Tim Noakes in, in South Africa, Annika Dahlquist in uh, Sweden. But if we go back, the people have been targeted um, you know, by the Coca-Cola and the sugar industry um, you know, turn of the last century for trying to get this message across. And But in recent times, it's really important that my case here in Australia was ultimately overturned in and Tim's case in South Africa and Annika's as well, because what it means that if you're a health practitioner, you're a medical a healthcare professional, doctor, health coach, you can now talk about this. And in Australia, there's been a lot of work done to get this as part of now our national diabetes strategy. You can put your diabetes into remission by adopting a low carbohydrate lifestyle. You know, they also talk about having bariatric surgery as well as also very low calorie drinks and all of those can put things into remission but bariatric surgery is very expensive has a high complication rate it's for an elite few people and it's op an operation on a normal organ for a lifestyle condition the very low calorie drinks are you know are commercially available they're a commercial product welcome to the big food industry tampering again and it's not sustainable so, you know, this concept of low carb, healthy fat living, you know, eating whole foods, fresh, local, seasonal is sustainable and it's achievable yeah. if you've got the right, if you've got the options available. And we can we can talk about that. You know, I think there are unfortunately yeah. wide tracks of society that don't have all those options available. But for those that choose it and have the opportunity to do it, then they can restore their health and literally overnight. You know, it's, a, it's it, you know. It's been a, a fabulous experience for me to actually give my patients their health back without operating. Yeah, amazing stuff, amazing stuff. So, so with that, I, I wonder if we could go a little bit because um, if I think about um, the discussions that I've had with mainstream nutritionists, which would just be a small fraction of what you've had to experience, um, but they they sort of accuse me. I'm, I'm I'm paraphrasing, I'm not exactly quoting, but ultimately it comes down to accusing me of imposing a sort of eating disorder on my on my clients because I recommend a low carb way of eating. Um, and they say that this is restrictive and they say that, no, you must eat according to the, assumably according to the whole guidelines. So what would you say, just playing devil's advocate, what would you say if I, if I were to tell you such a well, thing? Well, I'm, I'm not, we don't know each other well enough for me to start swearing, do we? <laughs> By all means, um, it, it, I actually think that the the dietary guidelines of of the Western civil Western uh, communities, where that's pretty well where they've come from, have been a social experiment over the last fifty to sixty years, and they've been an abject failure. So the experiment of the dietary guidelines hasn't worked. There isn't a society in the world that's adopted the dietary guidelines and gotten healthier. We can just see we've seen an explosion of obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, autoimmune disease, uh, cancer. All of those have exploded since the introduction of dietary guidelines. Quite specifically, those indigenous communities that have um, adopted Western food, and we're talking whether or not it's our indigenous communities here in, Tas in, in Australia over the last couple of hundred years since uh, the colonialization, white man coming. Um, and the same thing in Africa, those same things uh, to the um, indigenous communities in, uh, in uh, North America. The introduction of white man food, which is effectively the introduction of carbohydrate, sugars, and most recent times the seed oils, has been associated with a significant deterioration in their health. So wherever we've introduced guidelines, hasn't worked. What's fascinating is where those Western guidelines have come from, particularly the US, which has been largely adopted. And that all comes back to October 23, 1917, which was the formation of the American Dietetics Association. And so that for group was formed. They then uh, were <clears throat> giving advice to the US Defense Department and then ultimately into the into the food guidelines of the world. But the people who were writing that right at the beginning came from the processed food, and particularly the cereal industry. So when you actually go back in time, you find that 
the person who instigated that was a woman by the name of Lena Cooper. She was the first nutritionist dietitian for the US Defense Department. She wrote the textbooks for the next 30 to 40 years, which actually became the textbooks for all dietetics around the English speaking world. And her legacy continues on in textbooks nowadays. So I call that generational education. You believe your teacher, you believe your textbooks, and their teachers believe them. So this has been in place for 100 years. So we literally got off to the wrong foot. So when you look into, look into those textbooks, they were in fact vegan, vegetarian. They demonized meat. They were promoting the benefits of cereal and grains and carbohydrate. So you've got to work out where Lena Cooper came from. Now, Lena Cooper was working at that point in time where it was a protege of John Harvey Kellogg of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And Kellogg's Corn Flakes were actually, the whole corn flake, the whole cereal industry was started based on a religious ideology rather than actually for health benefits. I mean, it was presumed for health benefits, but it was actually believed. So there's an, an enormous difference between Western vegetarianism and veganism and Eastern vegetarianism. But the Western vegetarianism, and now we could talk about veganism, actually comes, you know, we, 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 I'm racing through a lot of Belinda's work very quickly here. But the Seventh-day Adventist church has been highly influential in determining the dietary guidelines of the Western world. And with that, everyone goes, oh, who's the Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, they, they were born out of the temperance movement in the mid 19th century in the US. They largely had work came around, their, their, their beliefs come from Ellen G. White, their prophetess. And they strangely enough, the, 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 her most vivid and most important thing in this whole topic is that she felt that if someone was to masturbate, they would never, that was the most evil of all sins, and they'd never go to heaven. So this is a basic ideology, and as a result of that, John Harvey Kellogg was working for the first family as a child. He was typesetting Ellen G. White's works at the age of 12, seeing that masturbation was the worst sin on the world, on the planet. What that meant for us now is that he invented breakfast cereal, Kellogg's cornflakes, to quell our lustful thoughts bland food to quell our lustful thoughts. <clears throat> and that flow on then became the cereal industry. Um, it was, yeah, he also invented nut analogues, you know, the first meat analogues, sorry, which were made from nut butters. Um, that group ended up bringing the soy industry into Western civilization. So with the Adventist group at this point in time effectively started the cereal industry of the world the soy industry of the world and the meat analog industry. So they are now the third big, the second biggest educator in the world after the Catholic Church. The highly influential around the world and particularly in developing nations, where they're trying to push this religious ideology of vegetarian veganism, high carbohydrate, highly processed food upon communities for their salvation because ultimately when the world's population moved towards vegan vegetarianism <clears throat> then according to their belief then christ will return now belinda and i we're not anti-religious okay we, we, we state this over and over you can have your beliefs and you can live by them and your family and all and your community but those beliefs should should not be determining the dietary outcome, the dietary guidelines of the world, particularly the Western world and now influencing into the, the, the non-Western world, because they're not based on science, they're based on a religious belief, and they're not based on biochemistry, they're not based on health outcomes, they're based on a belief that the Garden of Eden diet, fruits, nuts and seeds, is God's given diet. So the, the, God, you know, the, the Garden of Eden diet that they believe in doesn't actually even include vegetables. That only got introduced later in the piece. But the trouble is this group has effectively been writing the dietary guidelines since 1917. And then that's become... So your dietitians, your nutritionists, 
don't even realise that their textbooks are vegan vegetarian. The Australian textbooks, we've gone through them, actually barely have the word meat in them. Talks about protein. Um, even the my plate in the US now can't even bring itself to say meat. It just has protein in one quadrant. So this whole, it, it, it's, it, it's so insipid, but it's been so heavily, it's been crafted into our culture for a hundred years. So the poor dietitian who's giving you a hard time doesn't realise where her education has come from. So my education as a doctor has been corrupted as well. The Flexner Report in 1910, commissioned by Carnegie of Oil and Rockefeller of, uh, of sorry, yeah, of Steel, that literally came, they, they got rid of holistic health. And so we got rid of preventative health. And we keep talking about preventative health measures, but effectively we had the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry born 100 years ago, and now it's much easier in our education is to medicate people rather than to prevent disease you know diabetes is a chronic progressive disease that, that's what's been instilled in everyone's belief that you're just going to be going to more and more medication more and more insulin when simply a you know taking away the ultra processed food particularly the refined carbohydrates bang you can put it into remission and come off drugs incredibly powerful tool for the individual but costing a lot of money to a sickness industry, the food industry, pharmaceutical. Yeah. Gary, this is something that I haven't heard you talk about before. So you're mentioning the Carnegie Rockefeller or Rockefeller Carnegie report. Just tell me a little bit more about this, about that, that uh, report. Yeah, that was 1910. Abraham Flexner was the one commissioned to do the report. And again, it's all there in history. You know, it's fascinating with history. And we can actually go back to ancestral diets and, and down the track. But at that time, the Flexner Report was commissioned in the US and Canada. And Abraham Flexner went around and looked at all these different medical schools and effectively closed 50 of them, which were more holistic. Following on from that report, if those medical schools adopted the report and started to, you know, this more medicating and operating concept, then Rockefeller and Carnegie supported those institutions with the building of bigger medical schools, research facilities. So you can go around a lot of the US universities and see the amount of money that Rockefeller and Carnegie put into those institutions, which cemented the model of education in place of which we're still paying the price today. So the kind of... Because that's become the Western influence on, on medical guidelines. Yeah. So what you're saying is that this, this kind of the sick care industry, as we talk about it, or... or you know, hmm. um, you know, people, you know, the doctors have one, uh, one tool, and it's the prescription pad, this kind of model that we talk about in medicine, there was a time when it might that model may not have cemented itself is what I'm hearing you say, is that correct? Absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, and, and it's so entrenched now, I mean, we, we're trying to actually put this low carb concept into our education facilities right now. It's been adopted by as I say, the National Diabetes Strategy, so that we can actually say this is a powerful tool but you try and get this into the education system in the universities and we come up against the same old barriers. And when you look into those barriers, we find that the universities have dramatic, significant fundings, both personal to senior heads and academics in, the hosp you know, in, in those universities, but also the universities themselves in research funding. Hundreds of thousands of dollars going to academics, millions of dollars going into research. To, to keep the status quo, to keep everything going as it is. Wow. And again, so that, you know, that, that's where you just simply follow the money. The system doesn't want to change and empower the individual. The, the Adventist church, I don't think they're vindictive. I don't think they're nasty people. I think they're actually well-intentioned. They believe in their product. They believe that this is going to be the pathway forward for salvation and health. But the trouble is they're actually not as healthy as they keep telling us that they are. So they quote figures that they keep 
studying themselves. But the Adventist health studies are completely flawed, A, because they were done literally, the, the, whole, the whole Adventist health studies, which are quoted over and over as being beneficial for vegetarianism and longevity and health. They was, that whole process was started by a fellow by the name of Harry China Miller. He was an American, but he, he named China because he set up a whole lot of institutions. Um, uh, and then and soy industries in China then brought that concept back to the US and to get it into infant feed and to baby formulas. But he came back to the US to set up research to prove the visions of Ellen G. White. Not to, not, 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 and the scientific method is to disprove the, 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 you know, the paradigm. You know, if you get an email from me, it says at the bottom, science evolves by being challenged, not by being followed. You know, that's the scientific method, challenge, 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 because the moment you disprove it, you know, the black swan, everyone thought in the world, in the world, white swans were the only way until they found black one, one black swan disproved everything. So the same thing, but what happened here is we've actually got one religious group, which has set up research, which has been repeated over and over and over as being proof, but it was flawed from the outset to prove that Ellen G. White's visions were correct. When you delve into that, you actually find that their definition of veganism is to not have meat more than once a month and vegetarianism to not have meat more than once a week. Well, that's not the one in popular media. So they were, you know, they're, they're cheating in their own studies. And we understand Ellen G. White was probably still eating meat in her 70s. So, you know, like preaching one thing, doing another. We've heard that, you know, that, 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 that happens in every culture, doesn't it? You know, the leadership preaches one thing. And, um, but, you know, we, you know that, that sort of leads on to another historical topic of whoever controls the protein controls the people. So I, I talk about the difference between animal-based foods and then plant-based foods. So an animal-based food has, has a complete protein profile, essential proteins, has a complete healthy fat profile. It contains micronutrients and minerals in just the, in the right proportions because we're all just animals as human beings. And plant-based foods have an incomplete protein profile. They have an incomplete fat profile. They have poor bioavailability, have poor nutrients, poor minerals, poor micronutrients. So if you're going to have a plant-based diet, it has to be supplemented and carefully supplemented. And so, but historically, societies recognise that we've had the royalty have crown land. So they can, can, they can keep their, they can hunt and keep their animal protein and animal, healthy, complete animal profile coming through nutritionally. And the commoners were given the commons to, to cultivate for the grains. And I, and I think there's a classic quote by Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. And I think it sums it a whole lot up there that said, literally, if you're, if you're the upper class and the royalty, then you have the ability to get good food and the lower classes don't. And as a result, if you can control that protein, now we're actually, we're actually seeing that now playing out with this whole push towards plant-based proteins, pea proteins, soy proteins, huge monocultures stripping our soil of, 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 of the nutrients. But nonetheless, those, those proteins are incomplete, but they have the advantage of shelf life, transportability and profit. So we've got this enormous marketing campaign out there saying you should be plant-based, plant-based and plant-based. Well, it's not based on science. It's not based on the biochemistry. It's based on someone's profitability. Yeah. And it's not you as the consumer. It's not profitable for you as a consumer because you're going to end up sick. Yeah, yeah. So Gary, I want to... Uh, the, sorry. Yeah, so if you can control the guidelines and control the rhetoric around it mm. and control the education of the medical student 
the nurse, the, the health coach, and whatever. And the poor, the poor dietitians don't even realise they've been conned. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's Gary, very confronting what, to find out your textbooks were wrong. Yeah, no, it, it's true enough. Um, I want to ask you something because I, I used to live in Australia, um, but long time ago in the in the late nineties, I lived for a couple of years. I did my masters at a place called uh, La Trobe University outside of Melbourne, mm -hmm. and. Um, at the time, I happened to have been a vegetarian. I, in fact, I was pretty much vegan at that time. Um, and it, was, it wasn't it was easy for me to live as a vegetarian or a vegan in, in Australia. And I couldn't imagine this ideology taking hold in the way that you describe in Australia. So has, have things changed really that much since I've been there? Is it, is it really, is it common to find vegetarians in Australia now or, or is it still? Oh, that was a lot of people saying they are. Yeah. We look at food consumption and it's probably not, but it's certainly, it's being really pushed as an educational aspect. So this, so I look at our children, I look at our grandchildren's lunchbox, you know, what, what's, you know, recommended at school. I look at um, uh, functions, you know, there is, you know, like I was at a function the other day and there's a clear vegetarian table. You quite in nineteen nineties that wouldn't have existed. So you know every, this political correctness of having oh, having the vegan vegetarian option available. It, it's still only a small percentage, but it's now there's this push, particularly in the younger people, and we've got our, our kids and you know ones in her twenties, and she finds that when she's out and about it's harder to eat meat because of everyone else giving her a bit of a hard time. Not everyone, but it's this passive aggression against you eating too much meat. We have the media talking about meatless Mondays. I just heard that the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists here in Australia are having a meeting and they're going to have a meatless day. Why? You know, why are we promoting this ill health? Because it's not based on science. It's not based on health outcomes. It's helped based on perceptions and a media that kept having spreading a message of fear, repeating it and controlling that message going out. And the only people who've got the power to keep doing that is people with a lot of money or a lot of belief. And so that, you know, we, I come back to the Seventh Day Adventist group as, as a whole. They have positioned themselves into very senior positions within the World Health Organization, United Nations, advisory bodies in most Western countries, half a dozen of the prime ministers and uh, presidents of Polynesian countries are now Seventh-day Adventists, all wow. trying to move this Western highly processed dietary guideline into their communities and most of those indigenous communities are highly insulin resistant. They're already struggling with obesity and diabetes. The 10 top countries for obesity in the world are the Polynesian islands. Every country I hear says, oh, we've got the highest obesity rates in the world. I'm sorry, you don't. It's actually the Polynesian countries in the, po in the blue Pacific are ranked one to 10. And they take up numbers one to nine for diabetes. And Kuwait comes in at number 10 there. And why is Kuwait in there at number 10? I have my theories, but what, what's your theory? They don't, they don't drink alcohol. A lot of cocoa. So they have lots of, sugar, they have lots of sugar sweetened beverages. Yeah. I mean, that would imply that drinking alcohol is a healthier option, which I don't think is, is what we mean. <laughs> but it's something, yeah, it's something, maybe something related to that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think in general, I, if you spend time in the Middle East, um, there's just a lot of sugar everywhere. Um, yeah, that, that, you're right. There's a lot of sugar there, yeah. but they have. Um, um, yeah, they, I think what's happening is countries around the world have this perception that eating a standard American, a standard Australian diet, these dietary guidelines, is a healthier option because you know it's come with the healthy message. It's just an abject failure. I've got my, my personal story is I, I didn't eat particularly well in my 40s. I thought I'd um, try and eat better. You know, I thought I'd go and eat by the dietary guidelines and all I did was put on weight. Then I was trying to outrun my bad diet. And now I don't, you know, if I, 
in Australia here, you can do a, you can actually assess whether or not you're eating healthy or not. It's one of these healthy Australian guideline websites. And I score, I think, 23 out of 100. You know, I'm a complete failure because I'm not eating the dietary guidelines. But I'm infinitely healthier, metabolically healthier, by doing exactly what they're telling me not to do. Uh, as, yeah. are, as are many people now. For sure, for sure. I, I am definitely one of them as well. Um, I shudder to think what I'd score on that chart. Um, but maybe, maybe I'll do it just out of, out of curiosity. Um, <laughs> Let's go back to the to the countries you're talking about. So the South Pacific, um, we are talking about countries like the Solomon Islands, Fiji, uh, Tuvalu. Um, have I got the? Am I in the right part of the world? Yeah, yeah, Vanuatu, Vanuatu. Uh, um, Papua New Guinea, yep. PNG. Okay, yep. and and the last I checked, which admittedly, I, I so I used to have a job where I was the head of the Asia Pacific, you know, department for this uh, NGO. And I looked up some nutrition statistics. I'm talking about a good 20 years ago, I would say. Um, and there was hardly, at least there wasn't measured obesity. Some, some of those countries, there wasn't much good data at that point in time. But the countries that had data, you know, the obesity rates were very, very less at that time. So what you're describing is that in 20 years, it's skyrocketed and now it's suddenly the number one. What, what, what is behind that? How has that happened? Oh, it's, it's Western processed food. Um, I mean, it's cheaper to buy a soft drink in Vanuatu than it is to drink water or milk. Um, the staples are now uh, rice and cereals and grains rather than their local their local food. Um, you can go to their markets, and, and I say I've done my foreign aid work there for several years, and you go to the markets, and the markets have got good food in them. But the supermarket... 50 metres away is just selling these huge um, bags of highly polished, highly refined rice, which becomes a staple. And it, 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 traditionally, my understanding of Asian cultures is you have a small amount of rice with your meats and your vegetables as available, but you weren't having the major component of that meal being a highly refined rice. The traditional rice has had, you know, the husks involved had more fibre where it, that, and it, was, it slow the glycemic index down. I'm not saying, I still think rice is an, you know, a, 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 a mac, as macronutrient, it's high, high amounts of carbohydrate and not a lot, not a lot of nutrition in it. But what, what they've done is they've moved towards having less of their local foods and more of this highly processed stuff, which comes coming in cheaper. Significant amounts of cooking oils in, in, in what I call industrial seed oils now, rather than cooking in their traditional ghees and butters. Uh, and it, it, it's literally with the introduction of this Western diet, all of these countries have seen the introduction of Western disease. And this has been well documented, whether or not it was in Africa, whether or not it's been... Well, you've probably heard of Western Price's work. Of course. Western A. Price. And he, 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 you know, again, we go back 100 years and he looked at indigenous cultures all around the world and found them to be healthy, lean. He was, as a dentist, he was looking at their dentition in particular. But he noted those, those cultures that were eating a traditional diet based on their environment were healthy and well without the cardiovascular cancer and, and, met, and metabolic diseases we see now. Introduce Western diet and there isn't a culture in the world that hasn't gone backwards with the introduction of this highly processed food. Yeah. The rice is I, interesting. There might be, but I haven't found it yet. I'm just, you know. Yeah, fair enough. The rice is interesting. I mean, I remember conversations that I used to have. Um, so, uh, you know, in those days, I'm talking about PNG. So we had some, some uh, people from PNG and they really, um, they were swimming upstream in that they hated rice. They, they had this whole thing about how rice is a foreign, you know, it's being brought by guest workers and so on who are working in the mines. Not that there's anything wrong with those people coming and working, that's fine. But our traditional starch, our traditional food is um, these, I didn't like them at all, but, but they, they found them very delicious, these kind of tough tubers. Um, that they would cook a certain way and so on. And they had many, many, many different varieties of these tubers. 
Um, and that was their traditional food together with lean meats. Um, and I think, you know, I think if you're going to have a carbohydrates in your diet or a lot of carbohydrates in your diet, as maybe they, they did have in their traditional diet, was based around that tuber, tumor, tuber, at least in some places, I think a good way to do it is with, with a, lot of, a lot of lean meats. Um, I think well, you may be aware, it was about some years ago, I came up with this nutritional model of inflammation and modern disease where it's a combination of perfect storm where you have too much sugar, too much refined carbohydrate, and you combine it with the polyunsaturated seed oils. And that creates inflammation, creates oxidation across a whole variety of tissues, the cell membranes, the blood vessel walls, every corner of the body. So I think you can get by with having higher amounts of carbohydrate in your diet, as long as you're not combining that with the seed oils, the vegetable oils. So those cultures, and again, I talk about this from a latitude point of view, the closer you are to the equator, the more sunlight you're exposed to, the higher levels of vitamin D theoretically you have. Vitamin D is critical to the metabolism of the byproducts of sugar and carbohydrate. So if you have high levels of vitamin D, you can get rid of some of that inflammatory material. But if that material becomes oxidized because of the seed oils within it, then that's just a whole lot of extra inflammation. So those traditional cultures, which actually were eating their, their fish, which would have had good oils in them, they were eating their meats, which would have had healthy fats in them, and they might have been having their tubers and their ground vegetables, they weren't having seed oils. They weren't, they, they, they just literally, I mean, if you only got to look at on YouTube and look up, you know, margarine production, and you just see what an industrial complex it is that, you know, it, 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 I mean, understanding that those vegetable oils were actually initially used as lubricants in, in, our, in our cars and our engines. And, and uh, they were used for making candles and they were used for bur for lighting our... So the fact is that as we started finding this thing called electricity and the light globe, and they had to find another use for this stuff and then it ended up entering our food cycle. Again, this social experiment of the last 60, 70 years, and they say, they say to the dietitians, how on earth did we evolve over the last couple of million years on an ancestral diet with very low rates of cancer, metabolic disease, diabetes, yeah. even osteoarthritis. So pre-agricultural revolution, osteoarthritis appears to have been very rare. Post-agricultural revolution, we started seeing that evolution of, of osteoarthritis. And it, this is stuff I've put together for a talk called Carbohydrate, the Dose is the Poison. But from an orthopedic point of view, when you look at cartilage damage in a joint, look at tendon damage around joints, you find the end products of glucose metabolism, of carbohydrate intake. You don't find inflammation secondary to trauma or proteins or fats. You find the byproducts of carbohydrate ingestion. No, it's fascinating. And it, it, it is fascinating because I've actually, and, 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 and the, there's a, some great stuff that came out of China in 2020. I keep saying that not everything bad came out of China in 2020. And this, this research was actually looking at inflammation in osteo osteoarthritis of the knee. And that was actually looking at the effect of insulin on osteoarthritis of the knee. So when the insulin levels went up, the inflammation went up. When the insulin levels went down, the inflammation went down. And I've seen that in a practical sense, you know, say to people with osteoarthritis of the knee, stop eating sugar and carbs. By definition, their insulin levels come down and they lose their pain or have a dramatic improvement of it within days to weeks and actually before they lose weight. So it's not about weight loss, it's about reducing inflammation. Now, I know that the Chinese missed the boat on that one because literally at the end of it, they said we should be targeting insulin from a pharmacological aspect. We should be trying to make money out of this when the simplest way to actually reduce insulin levels is don't eat carbohydrate. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Don't eat glucose. Therefore, your body won't be producing insulin. Yeah. You can help treat your own inflammation. 
In other words, if you're sitting on an ale, maybe don't invest in painkillers, maybe just stand up, yeah? <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's as simple as that. You know, and and you know, I actually think all of this is incredibly simple. I'm just frustrated and angry that we as a health profession are still inflicting this harm on patients. Yeah. If I can give my own um, N of one um, data point, I mean, I, I thought I had arthritis in my 30s. I remember I had a bum leg. Um, and I, so I'd wake up every morning and there would be severe pain. I'd have to sort of warm, warm myself up a little bit before I could go down the stairs. And um, I just thought it was normal, part of aging. I was like 36, <laughs> so I was hardly, I was hardly old. Um, and then I, the only intervention I made was that I gave up seed oils because I'd, I saw your talks and other people like you. Um, and I thought, okay, this is a pretty easy thing to do. Let me throw away all the canola oil and just switch to, at that time it was olive oil, which is probably still oxidized, honestly. Um, and, uh, and coconut oil. Olive, olive oil is a bit overrated, but nonetheless, it's better than the other but, ones. But the pain went away in a, in a matter of, I can't remember if it was days or weeks, but definitely within a month. I, 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 I'm now to the point where I can't remember which was my bum leg because there was no bum leg. Does that make sense? Oh, look, I, 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 I get it. I mean, I, 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 as time's gone on, I'm operating, you know, I was operating on less and less people. I've got a shoulder surgeon colleague who said he booked all of his patients for surgery six to eight weeks away and encouraged them all to go low carb keto. And most of his patients were cancelled six to eight weeks later. And he's in fact stopped operating because he just says this is such a powerful tool, he shouldn't be operating. But you know, not everyone can do it. I understand that. But I've got so many, you know, I know of people who can't do it. So they go along and see one of my colleagues who does the operation and knee replacement, hip replacement. I went, okay, that's all right. Um, but I, I, I get I'm at the point now where I think we're doing so much unnecessary surgery. You know, um, you know like bariatric surgery, you know, as I said before, it's on a normal organ. The preoperative workup on those patients before the six weeks before they have surgery is to put them on low carb meals so their liver shrinks. I've had this debate with surgeons. I say, well, if it's good enough for six weeks to make the surgery easier and they lose weight and the liver shrinks and turn around their fatty liver disease, why don't you go for another six weeks and then another six weeks and then another six weeks? You won't make any money. Yeah. Because, but yeah. You know, it's, I don't win any friends in my surgical colleagues when I keep saying stop operating. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned this because I have a client in Australia who had bariatric surgery. And the problem she had with the recommendation, the keto recommendation was that she just didn't receive enough support. I mean, they, you know, there were there are issues I know, for, and you know, from working with many people who've made this transition. There is a period of time when one needs to be wary of electrolytes, when one needs to be wary of like fat to protein, protein ratios. There's a period of time when we see the same complaints coming up again and again, so-called keto flu kind of complaints and so on. And if the, the, the nutritionist she was working at that time with had no capacity to give her any kind of advice on how to handle mm -hmm. that. Um, so, you know, if they're going to be making that recommendation, I hope that they would at least train themselves on how to deliver it properly. I, th this is exactly one of Belinda's topics about everyone who d needs undergoes a lifestyle change needs Sam in their life, support, accountability, motivation. And if you've got Sam in your life, you can actually, you're more likely to get there. I, I actually think a low carb keto diet is not hard. I think it's actually easy once you understand what we're talking about. And I, I alluded to this before, I'll say it now. My definition of nutrition dietary guidelines should be one sentence, and this is it. You should eat fresh, local, seasonal, whole food based on your culture and environment, avoiding added sugars and processed food. Now that's applicable anywhere on the planet. It also takes into account that latitude, 
because the, the closer you are to the equator, the more sunlight you're going to have the vitamin D levels theoretically higher. I know that vitamin D levels are not that high on equatorial populations, and that's partly because we've created fear and it's partly because pigmentation of the skin. But we've gotten this wrong. So, but again, that's an ancestral diet. There's no way we evolved without doing that. We didn't have transport miles. You couldn't... You, we didn't actually, we don't, we don't have teeth to eat cereals and grains. Yeah. The very first cultures that started doing that, actually, when you look at their molars and their dentition, their teeth were ground down at the back because they tried to eat grain. The only way you can eat grain is to process it, mill it, grind it, and it gets turned straight into glucose and sugar. It, it, it's the... Um, I've forgotten the fellow, he's up in Finland, um, but he was telling us about the very first bread and beer was made before the agricultural revolution. You can go back around twelve to 14,000 years and you find the first uh, introduction or finding of beer. So from an evolutionary aspect, beer and bread actually have no relevance because there's, there's no nutritional gain from eating them. So, in fact, it's probably the very first episodes of, he, of a hedonistic pursuit for feeling good. So somewhat you can, you can sort of imagine that there was a pile of grasses and seeds that got a bit of water in them, and they fermented up, and then someone drank it, and then all of a sudden felt lightheaded and... I'm, try I'm going back 14,000 years now. I don't have a camera. It wasn't on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. So it was literally that you can imagine that that sort of happened. Still trying to work out how they made the first breads. But literally, the, to go through that process has no nutritional gain, has no evolutionary benefit to us. Yeah. It was probably a hedonistic pursuit pursuit of pleasure whereas we can look at our our hunting skills over the last couple of million years once we started actually hunting and actually eating animal meats and particularly marrow then we had an increase in our brain development and we can tell that because you can actually look at remains and see ancestrally oh well, yeah fossil or not fossils but um ancestral remains where they actually were, had implements to crack the bone marrow. And then, so they were getting access to that. And with that, we saw an increase in our brain size. It's interesting, in the last 50,000 years, our brain size has come down by about 100 mil. Um, so our brain development, our ability to actually develop into where we are at this point in time was developed on the bases, we actually started to learn to hunt and eat animal yeah. proteins and fats. Yeah. Fantastic it's, stuff. It's, can, I, can I give you my quick perspective on that? You, you may find it interesting or you may find it irrelevant. Um, <laughs> but I'm but always, I, I, I am respectful. I, I will be interested. <laughs> well, it's up to you. Um, but, you know, the more I look into this, because I'm, I'm finishing a PhD in anthropology at the moment and I had to look at, to, into some of these questions, the more I look into it, um, those dates that you mentioned 12 to 14,000 years ago, um, it, you know, what happened in that time frame, we have the extinction of the large megafauna, these mammoths and so on, which is what early humans were preying on for 200,000 years before that, maybe longer, maybe 300,000 years before that, right? That's just Homo mm. sapien. You can go back to Homo erectus, was having very similar behaviors for 1.4 million years or whatever it is, right? So um, in other words, what I'm saying is that climate change happened. We don't know exactly why. Some people say it was meteor activity. Some people say there's other things going on. Climate change happened, ended the last ice age. These megafauna went extinct. And then humans had to find a way to survive. Uh, now, you know, because you've been studying this so long, you know that there's a concept called rabbit starvation, where if you eat only protein, you, you basically will die, you can't survive. Humans need uh, calories either from, they, in fact, they need a majority of calories, either from fat or carbohydrates or some combination of the two. 
And therefore, my hypothesis is nothing more than a hypothesis at this point in time, but, but we're trying to find more evidence that will at least shed some light on this story. My hypothesis is that in order to deal with the loss of the prey species, humans went through a time of starvation. Um, and in order to deal, you know, coming out of that time of starvation, starvation times are also innovation times. There are many different experiments going on. You mentioned the people who, with molars that are ground down because they're trying to, to eat improper foods. We have examples of people eating like acorns and all kinds of weird stuff from this time. Um, but coming out of that, you have two things. You have animal domestication, um, specifically animal domestication for milk, which had never happened before. Uh, horses milk and, and cows milk. Um, and milk, of course, is a great source of saturated fat, which is, again, those calories that you may need uh, if you don't have access to fatty animals. Um, and you also have, of course, uh, grain and, and grain-based civilizations and so on, what will later become, um, you know, the big, big, uh, you know, the, the Indus Valley civilization and, and, and so on. Um, so that may be one explanation of why those things happen at the time that they do. I, I'm, I'm on board with with that from a, a progress as man, and then we, the, we have, when we brought cereal and grain production into our livelihood, we also brought with it civilization as we know it. it wasn't just domestication of land; it was domestication of, um, of 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 our of our food production. I, I remember reading a paper sort of saying that how grain has domesticated humans for sure you ever heard that flip side yes it's yes many a... many people have um made that statement uh, somewhat provocatively but um yeah i, I, mean, rec I recognize it yeah but but what with so we it came with the bonus that we've, we now have civilization away from our nomadic hunter-gatherer concepts and the price we've paid for that now, as we've gone further and further down that pathway, is metabolic poor health. Uh, I also am aware, when you look at the Indus, but particularly the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire did poorly with its agricultural practice and they lost their topsoil. And arguably part of the fall of the Roman Empire was actually because of its poor cropping practices. And we can see that right around the world now. Um, I remember reading a, a formative book for me it was Collapsed by Jarob Diamond, probably 20 odd years ago I read that. Uh, there's a great book called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization by Montgomery at the moment. It's been out for a few years. But effectively, if we don't look after our soil, then we don't look after the nutrition of our soil. We don't look after that. It means poor nutrition in our food. It means poor nutrition in our bodies. It means poor, poor metabolic health across the across the board. And the thing which still concerns me is that the majority of that, our management of the soil is related to our industrial monocultures on it, rather than our ruminant and animals. We've only got four percent of the world's land which is arable. We've got 20 to 25 percent, which is actually grassland, which could be actually nurtured in a different fashion. So we could actually have a ruminants on that 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 sort of agricultural land. Yeah, I don't have all the answers because I, because it, you know, do we have enough food on the planet to feed people? We we probably do. We just don't do it very well. Food wastage is so great. Um, what was that figure I read recently? The third greatest producer of greenhouse gases on the planet by country size is actually food waste 100%. after China and the US. And the majority of that is, is plant-based food. Um, it's whatever we're doing, we, we're not doing it right. I've got my ideas, which the, per, the individual can do. And the individual has the decision choice of what to eat today, what not to eat, whether or not they want to fast and not fast. The problem is, I, you know, I, I see our governments and our educational institutions are, have been manipulated by forces, whether or not it's conscious or subconscious, which are actually stopping this health message going forward. I, I, I don't know the answer for the whole planet. I know I'm very fortunate that where we live, we have access to fresh local seasonal whole food. 
uh, there are vast tracts of society that don't have the access to, you know, complete proteins, complete healthy fats, and and that becomes it becomes part of a social uh, dilemma. It, it, it is definitely part of the discussion, and it relates to the last question I want to ask you, Dr. Gary Fetke, which is that, you know, um, there's a big part of the world here in Africa um, or in, in, in Asia who are sort of entering the global middle class. Um, and as such, you know, in India, when I used to live in India, it was, you know, Pizza Hut and McDonald's were sort of status symbols. Like when you started eating there, you had you had changed your your sort of class status and you were no longer, you know, poor, basically. Now you're now you've entered the, the, the middle class. So what would you say to an individual who who is faced with these choices? Um, at the same time, those same people I'm talking about, they could have chosen to continue to eat like their their parents and the grandparents, which may not have been an ideal ideal diet, but it wasn't, you know, processed uh, pizzas and, and, and Coca Cola. So what would you say to someone who, who's looking at the, the Western way of eating, but also considering their traditional way of eating? What would you say to such a person? If it's cheap and nasty, it's going to be cheap and nasty long term. I say that it, 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 it is it it's expensive in time to eat fresh local seasonal. It's not necessarily more expensive in money. It t takes time and effort to actually go out and shop for your fresh produce and cook in a traditional family sense where everyone is involved in it. That, that takes time. And a lot of people say they don't have time to do that. So they do go along and have that fast food. But I've said over and over, if you've got a choice of spending that time preparing your food now, buying the best quality food that you can afford, which is fresh local seasonal, then you've got a choice of spending that time now or you've got a choice of spending that time in my waiting room in the long term. Because there is going to be a metabolic price, there's going to be a health cost associated with poor eating. We pay more attention to what fuel we put in our cars than we do to what fuel we put in our bodies. And you've only got one, you've only got one chance. You've only got one life. Put the best possible food that you can get access to with the right information that's out there. And I'm concerned that there's so much disinformation, I call it deliberate misinformation that's out in society which is taking away a very simple health message that I'm giving. I come back to that, you know, with what, what's contentious with what I've said, an ancestral way of eating, fresh local seasonal whole food based on your culture and environment, avoiding added sugar and processed food. That empowers the individual, disempowers the corporates, it decentralises buying power, it puts it back to the local farmer, the local community. but it's not good for the corporates and that's why i get into trouble that's why i got into trouble because biochemically i haven't lost an argument i haven't lost a debate on this we come down to the biochemistry of glucose and fructose and seed oils we come down to the biochemistry of inflammation it's a complete no-brainer so I'm very happy for people to have their opinion. And I actually quite like, I want people to have an opinion, form an opinion. But then I try and work out how they've actually come to that opinion. And, it, and, if, and if I disagree with it, I may learn something by actually challenging that. And that's certainly all I've done. I've just poked these houses of cards, which is nutrition, and they just keep collapsing all over the place. And when you go back, they're actually not based on science, they're based on opinion, they're based on money, or unfortunately, they're based on a religious ideology by a small group, but a very small and powerful group who have infiltrated right across Western cultures and now actually trying to get across the entire world. Not based on health or well-being, even though they might believe in it, but based on a product. So Christ can return. I mean, I can't, I can't actually make this up. And you know, this, this works actually, um, if you go to the uh, Seventh-day Adventist literature where they, they've published this and they've actually put Belinda's work is in the references. You know, they're, they're actually very proud of it. 
they're very proud of what they're doing. They don't hide it. It's 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 about getting that that health reform message out there to the population. Yeah. Well, we have to be equally vocal and equally um, stringent in trying to get our message out. So, Dr. Gary Fetke, it's been a real honor and a pleasure. Dr. Gary Fetke, one of the few surgeons who who wants surgery to uh, to not happen, doesn't want you on his table. Um, it's been a real pleasure, sir, and I hope we can do this again. All right, Samir, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Dr. Gary Fetke. If you like this content, please do remember to like, subscribe, and leave a review. You can also check out my website, samirdasani.net, for more content like this. With that, I'm Samir. I'm a health coach and a PhD student based in Johannesburg. I'll see you next time.